Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. Today's sponsor is Audible. They're the leading provider of spoken audio and entertainment. Listen to an audiobook wherever and whenever you want. I do. For more information, to get your free trial, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Lutz, audiblepodcast.com slash L-U-T-Z. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz on 1590 WPSL. When is a default? Not a default. Certainly when you default, it's a default. When your government defaults or an exchange defaults, it's just noise. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. Move along. They've been trying to get this guy to move along for years. He just won't. Ranting Andy Hoffman, welcome back. Oh, what a great intro. Uh, That's right. Well, it's it's only gold and silver where it's not news. If it's anything else, it's major news. Yeah, well, it... But let's face it, unless it's something physical, there can't be a default because there's always another dollar to be printed. There's always another euro to be minted. And there's always another yuan to pay off a corrupt Chinese party official, right? Well, of course. And uh, we were just talking today about a piece I wrote that'll be out in a few days about the defaults everywhere. You know, starting with the big kahuna when the Germans ask for their gold and they're going to wait seven years for it. Uh, possibly it's the deep storage gold that uh, Barrick Gold holds at Pasco Lama that's never coming out of the ground. And, of course, AB and AMRO's announcement in March that they're defaulting on all their physical gold contracts with clients. They're the largest bank in the Netherlands. And the Hong Kong exchange this weekend is no longer uh, – um, they are no longer honoring contracts. They're just going to cash settle them. And we were mentioning the Shanghai exchange is, hasn't delivered any gold all month uh, after pretty much delivering – theoretically, more gold than that, that's been produced uh, for the past couple of months, and uh, and so on and so on. Yeah, so explain to me something, Andy. Like, the inventories on the COMEX are, like, at all-time lows, if you could believe anything that's there. Um, is this a trend here? Is this gold just disappearing? Or is it just statistical uh, tampering? I don't know what it means exactly that those gold inventory numbers, do they mean anything? Well, put it this way. You're, you're talking to, you know, the preeminent gold manipulation expert who spends his entire life uh, doing research on it and publishing it. And I honestly don't even look at the COMEX inventories. I mean, yes, they have come out recently with, with data, whether you believe it or not, that shows that the gold inventories in particular have really plunged. I mean, off the charts, uh, actually, J.P. Morgan who, who it turns out was behind 90% or 99% of all the selling, the paper selling in the last few months, their physical inventories are down to almost nothing. Uh, so if you believe it, it's very significant. But I lost faith in all those COT numbers uh, back in 2008 when when uh, when silver went to 50 bucks an ounce and literally every it was like it was last month. Every mint on earth was out of silver. And yet the measly 30 million ounces that they supposedly had of of uh, registered silver on the COMEX didn't get taken up. No one bought it. So to me, at that point, I didn't believe anything they said. But let's face it, all these shortages and defaults that we're talking about are clearly symptoms that something is very, very wrong in the physical versus paper world, especially with what we've seen, these paper attacks uh, in the last couple of months. Yeah. I mean, and what about the premiums? They've settled down a little bit, but they're still at historically high rates, aren't they? Yeah, they've settled down. I mean, uh, uh, gold has come back down uh, more than silver, but silver has always been the, the bigger problem because there's much less of it. Uh, and uh, right now they're above average, but they are, you know, they're not what where they were a few weeks ago. But it's, you know, as I, I did a podcast with Rob Kirby the other day, and he was just talking about how, you know, you read this everywhere around the world. It's completely different. The U.S. retail market is not symptomatic of the entire world. Um, I mean, the retail market, for instance, in Japan, you literally can't buy anything right now. People are so scared. And, uh, you know, people are running, racing to the stores across across the Far East to purchase product. Uh, you know, the Chinese uh, wealth funds are buying a lot for Andrew, Andrew McGuire. So it's very, very hard to get 
large volume, uh, you know, overseas. So it's it's kind of a, a very opaque market, but clearly the evidence points to you know massive, massive demand. In fact, I just read that in Dubai, they there was more imports of gold uh, last month than there were in all of the last year. That shows you how strong things were. And of course, I, I've mentioned how Miles Franklin. Uh, April was our best month in our 24-year history by tw- by 40 percent. That's how much demand we saw uh, in April. Yeah, and I see this from every bullion dealer that I talk with. They're all saying, you know, they're busy as can be. One little skeptic mentioned to me, well, if they're if the price is so high, how come they're only going to buy at spot? You know, if the shortage is so bad and. Uh, you know, I, I've got my own opinion about that, but how do you answer that one, Ant? Well, like I said, the retail market in the States has calmed down in the past week. It's very quick how it goes up and down. People already have forgotten that in January, the, the mint sold out for 12 days and that we sold, you know, more product in January than ever in history. And people forget all about that. They forget that the mint closed early in December because they were they were out of product. They forget what happened in 2011, not once, but twice. First when silver went to 50 bucks in May, and then when it got slammed by uh, Operation PM Annihilation in September. These things come and they go very quickly. And, uh, you know, the cartel thus far has been able to quell all of these surges. But uh, but again, they're like lightning strikes. And, you know, you could, we could be talking a week from now, and we'll be back to where we were last month. <laughs> hey, and you, I don't know if you caught this article, but at your favorite uh, governmental-controlled mint, uh, talking about the Perth Mint, they had lines around the block the week before last, you know, for about two or three weeks, the people were just lined up trying to get physical in, in Australia. And I put more credence in them because they understand these things better than the U S because they're a resource based economy, much like Canada is, and they couldn't get enough. So like you say, it, it goes very quickly. I guess the higher premiums pulled out some supply. I don't know exactly what, but certainly, uh, the supplies have been tenuous. I don't think there's any question about that. Well, the supply chain is limited and let's face it. I mean, production right now is not going anywhere. And when you read that the Chinese uh, have been importing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tons, they're not buying coins from the U.S. Mint. They're, they're, they're trying to buy it from the smelters. There's just not that much product out there. So if you are a big wealth fund trying to buy in size, it's very difficult and you're going to pay big premiums right now. That's why it's valuable to have a source like Andrew McGuire because he's kind of up in that world. Uh, and as for the, as you said, you know, you go to the, the Eastern Hemisphere, people do understand metal. That's why you've had lines everywhere in the Far East. Uh, and I guess that would include Australia. In India today, just today, the uh, economic minister or finance minister literally begged people to stop buying gold. He said, you have to calm your compassion, your your passion for gold for the good of the country. I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> The rupee is still sitting near all-time lows right now. They have, they were just touting how it was great that they only have six percent inflation, and of course, everyone cooks their books, including the Indians. I mean, they're having. In fact, I have a I have a client that called me the other day who is Indian, and I mentioned inflation, and he said it's just off the charts there. It's so horrible. So no matter what the government tries, people are going to keep buying physical gold over there. Yeah, and they're going to do it all over. Because in the final analysis, they don't care about the government. It's it, it's about you. Are you going to survive? Screw the government. Who cares about them? It's all about uh, getting yourself through it. And uh, it's going to be interesting when the corporations start buying metals up. We've been waiting for that for a while. But just imagine an Apple saying, you know, silver, maybe we should just buy up a bunch of silver because we're going to need it anyway. And it'll probably, uh, it'll be a hedge against inflation, against hyperinflation. Just makes sense. And when a bunch of companies start doing that, who really have bucks to put into it, forget it. Well, you know, we've tried for years uh, to try to figure out the dynamics behind all the fraud and the paper versus physical. We know very well that silver is the second most widely used commodity on earth. Only crude oil has more uses. 
and that most of the uses of, of uh, silver are indispensable, that you, you can't really replace it with other metals, and that it takes up most of the, the, pr the production uh, to start with before you even have the investment demand. And then you have uh, falling production, you have things like what happened at the Kennecott mine. So it's pretty clear that we are as tight as a drum, and, and you know, what we were just talking about what happened last month in the U.S. Mint. So what will it be? That, that that takes us over the edge, that breaks these guys and, and causes the price to be you know, valued properly, certainly well above its cost of production. I just don't know, I, I except that I know it will happen. No doubt, and those days are coming soon. So, uh, so anyways, uh, what else do we have here? We had a potential, a threatened Moody's downgrade uh, that Zero Hedge uh, discussed as a possibility why gold is up close to 2% today. And you and I believe that's really kind of a non-event at this point. Right. Well, actually, what we were talking about was, for people who aren't watching, I mean, last night, Sunday night, you know, I talk about my Sunday night sentiment attacks I've written about for years. They <laughs> literally attempted a second coming of the Sunday night paper silver massacre that we saw on May 1st, 2011. When the markets opened uh, about 6 o'clock Eastern time, when I say opened, I mean thin traded paper platforms in Asia before everything is really open. Silver was down 7% this morning. It was down over $1.50 after being down 2 bucks or whatever last week while nothing else was moving. Even gold was barely down. It was that ridiculous as a, a flash crash. And, uh, you know, what? whether they're crazy, I mean, if, if they are simply just trying to you know, create some kind of flashpoint in the market, in the physical market. They're doing a damn good job at it. And, of course, by uh, midday today, we've seen, uh, you know, a turnaround a big way. Uh, yeah, gold's up, of course, exactly 2%, and it was stopped at exactly the 12 o'clock capital last resort. But still, it was down $15 less or $20 last night. It's up 30 now. And silver was down, and now it's up, et cetera. But, um, you know, as you said, there's rumors of a Moody's potential downgrade if we don't get our budget in order. But, I mean, we've been hearing this for years. I mean, so, uh, Standard and Poor is, yeah, I know they're being sued by the government because the government doesn't like them. But, you know, where's their second downgrade that they promised $3 trillion of debt ago? Uh, where was Moody's in the first place? Where's Fitch? Where's anybody? You know, these de downgrades are, are completely immaterial because the companies are paid by the clients. I mean, they're paid by the government to give them ratings. Well, effectively, the government created their franchise and dodd frank basically made that franchise uh, immortal you can't get rid of it anymore so these ratings uh, outfits cannot exist without the support and sponsor sponsorship of the u.s government so are you going to bite the hand that feeds you richly billions of dollars a year and i don't know about you but and then God forbid you do bite that hand. You'll find yourself out on the sidewalk. You'll find your company being sued by the Justice Department and all sorts of horrible things happening all around you because you buck the trend. Yeah, I mean, credit rating agencies, it's just such a comedy if you, you look at how the game works and how horribly they've been discredited. I mean, it's almost like believing, uh, you know, listening to Ben Bernke's thoughts about inflation is like listening to Moody's with their thoughts about uh, credit worthiness. I mean, they are completely and completely biased and at the same time a bit stupid about these things. And they've been wrong forever. So who would care? I mean, I guess it would be a news event if one of the big three uh, did a downgrade. But again, Moody's is still triple A, uh, 17 trillion <laughs> into our debt. Uh, and, um, you know, you don't uh, you know, you've seen real credit agencies like uh, like Egan Jones uh, who has who is not biased downgrade us numerous times and what did they do to Egan Jones? They sued them. So I wouldn't worry too much. But yes, this will be the you know market action makes commentary. They will forget all about the fact gold has been trashed for no reason and simply say there was a rumor that Moody's might downgrade the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, these uh, agencies have all the credibility of a prostitute in a convent. You know, forget <laughs> it. It's like uh, you know, I just tune them out a long time ago it's just a little background noise every now and then it's kind of like uh, putting hot pepper on what's otherwise a very bland pizza the pizza still tastes like cardboard the cheese still has no taste but at least it's a little spicy 
and uh, gives you a reason to finish the slice. But that's it. Well, yeah, it's like uh, we saw, I just saw a headline today. I didn't even read it. It was in Zero Hedge. It says, Goldman proves that uh, bad news is good for stocks and good news is good for stocks. And that's <laughs> the whole point. I mean, right, right now, the government has complete control of paper financial markets of all kind. Not, not physical gold and silver markets, but paper everything. So really, it doesn't matter what news is out. It doesn't matter if we're in recession. It doesn't matter if we're downgraded to, to junk status. It doesn't matter if Greece is downgraded to junk. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. What matters in my world is protecting my assets with the only thing that they can't get their hands on, which is real money. Hey, and you just reminded me of something when Goldman says, bad news is good for stocks. Good news is good for stocks. No news is good for stocks. Reminds me of that uh, French play, I can't remember who it was by, maybe Voltaire, Candide and Zadig, where he says, he's a naive kid, and he says, everything happens for the best. So whether you get slammed or held up in the street or whatever it is, it's all happening for the better. And that's what the government wants you to believe, what the banksters want you to believe, what the Fed wants you to believe is, no matter how badly things suck, it's all happening for the but, better. There's a plan. But they don't suck. We're in a recovery. Don't you know that? The <laughs> ambiguous, amorphous <laughs> word recovery that we have heard. Heck, we can go back to the year 2000 since the tech wreck. And every month, it's nothing but recovery, recovery, recovery. It's meaningless, but that's the word they use. And, and by the way, when we talk about uh, you know recovery, this housing bubble that they've now created with the printing money, I mean, it is really starting to get crazy because I'm feeling it here now mm-hmm. and I'm seeing the stories and the home building and all that stuff. And this is amidst the worst economic conditions that we've had since the bottom in 2008. And they're only getting worse. The data is as bad as it's been. And it is truly remarkable how they're blowing up this bubble right now because it is going to be such a spectacular collapse uh, if, if it, you know, the second that. QE is either this slow down or the market overwhelms it because there's no way interest rates are going to stay down here forever. And it truly is remarkable to see an actual housing bubble being created amidst a massive recession. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty remarkable. And uh, yeah, you're right. I forgot, uh, you know, more Obama phones out there than ever before. So as long as you can get your Obama phone, then everything is fine. The recovery continues right on track and you have nothing to worry about. So milesfranklin.com, sign up for Andy's newsletter to get more of his wit and witticisms, as well as Bill Holter and David Checkman's. And always tune in to the financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Come to the Liberty Mastermind Symposium, libertymastermind.us. We're really looking forward to it. 15 incredible speakers, not telling you stuff you're just going to read in the paper, but really giving you the one-on-one what it's all about. Andy, we'll talk to you next week. And, uh, you know, try to sleep on those Sundays. Sunday is a day for relaxing and, you know, just putting it all on hold because you got all week to get crazy, right? I agree, but when there's a Sunday night paper silver massacre, I'm just doing my job. So hopefully there won't be another one. You're on the case. All right, and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, later. This show was brought to you by Audible. When it comes to audiobooks, there's only one place to go. That's audiblepodcast.com slash Lutz. Audiblepodcast.com slash L-U-T-Z. Sign up today. Get a free one-month membership and a free audiobook. And send us an email. Let us know how you like that book. 